in. The next item of business is a member's business debate on motion 10471 in the name of Ivan McKee on driverless cars bringing transformative change to Scotland. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. I have to ask members to press the request to speak buttons now because we haven't got that by the aid of technology yet. You still have to use your finger. I call on Ivan McKee to open the debate. Mr McKee, please. Uh, th <clears throat> thank you, President Officer. I'm delighted to be leading this debate this afternoon. It's not often we get the opportunity to start with a largely blank piece of paper and shape our own future if we choose to. The issue of automation is something we're all well aware of. Understand it's coming perhaps faster than we think and while it offers some opportunities, there are many threats in particular to existing jobs. In general terms, the challenge can seem daunting and difficult to grasp. By focusing on one technology as we're doing this afternoon, we can explore specific challenges and opportunities and map out a path forward with detailed actions and milestones to make sure we take advantage of this te new technology. It doesn't take advantage of us. And let us be clear, this debate is not about whether we think autonomous vehicles are a good idea or a bad idea. If they are coming, and all the evidence says that they are, and faster than we think, our job is to find ways to mitigate their downsides and exploit the opportunities they present for all of society. Presiding officer, throughout history, disruptive transformations in transport technology have driven significant economic development. From the digging of the canal infrastructure in the 1790s, the rollout of the railways in the 1840s, the rise of the automobile in the early 1900s, the expansion of commercial air traffic from the 1950s onwards, and the adoption of the internet from the 1990s while transporting information rather than goods and people is the latest transport revolution to drive economic growth. We are due another disruptive transformation and we need to be prepared. Let's imagine for a moment what the average personal transport experience of the near future will look like. You might own a car, or you might have a contract with a car lease or a car share company, either to part share or pay as you go. If you own a car, you might send it out to work to generate income from you when you're at work. You'll use an app on your mobile device to order up a vehicle as needed. The total number of vehicles on the road is much lower than today, but each car does a lot more miles. The number of vehicles available for hire, however, is 10 or 20 times what exists today. So in most areas, you don't have to wait more than two or three minutes for a car to turn up at your door. You might order several vehicles, one to take you to work, one for your spouse, and a third to take the children directly to school. No more school run. Without the need for driver interface vehicles, uh, cars look nothing like they do today. A comfortable pod type design, you sit in the back like the back of a hackney cab or a limo, perhaps working or relaxing. The vehicle knows what radio station or music you like to listen to. Your email is available in an in-car terminal or a favorite TV show or film. Travel time becomes hugely more productive. Because the car is connected to all other vehicles on the road, it knows the fastest way to work, avoiding traffic. Today's traffic management systems, expensive infrastructure designed to manage drivers' erratic behaviour are far simpler. The impact of autonomous vehicles will affect not just our relationship with man's best friend, his or her car, but go far beyond their personal transport experience. 97% of a car's time is spent parked. Self-drive will transform our cities, enabling higher housing density. Garages and multi-storey car parks can become spare rooms and blocks of flats. Driveways and parking lots become gardens and parks. Lines of parked cars replaced by cycle lanes. Ironically, self-drive will give us more space and scope to promote active travel solutions. On energy, today's concerns about sufficient tra uh, charging points for electric vehicles and how to manage peak demand will be much simpler. Self-drive vehicles will take themselves to charging warehouses and optimally top up their batteries to help smooth demand to meet supply. Infrastructure spend will be revolutionised. Interconnected autonomous vehicles without erratic drivers behind the wheel will use road space much more efficiently. The same amount of traffic will flow smoothly along a single lane as currently clogs up our three-lane highways. We can see that the advent of self-drive will affect all sectors. Indeed, it's only a matter of time until somebody writes a country and western song where the guy's truck leaves him as well. <laughs> and in the area of inequality, the impacts could be significant and to our advantage if we grab the initiative now. Rather than let others exploit the technology first, people with disabilities, including sight loss, will be able to access personal transport on the same basis as everyone else. Those growing old and frail need not worry about losing access to their vehicles. Without the cost of the driver, the cost of private hire will come tumbling down providing affordable connectivity to those on low incomes and peripheral housing schemes. 
And let us not forget the more than 1 million road deaths annually, 94% caused by driver error. We owe it to those to move forward towards this vastly safer technology as soon as possible. Scotland was at the very forefront of the first two of the transport revolutions I mentioned earlier. Our canals enabled raw materials to move to population centres and ports, and our railways enabled movement of manufactured goods to market. The economic boost from both of those innovations generated wealth that notwithstanding its unequal distribution, to some extent we are still living off today. The innovators behind the last two transport revolutions came from these islands. Frank Whittle, inventor of the jet engine, and Tim Berners-Lee, inventor of the web. But sadly, we failed to take the lead in exploiting those 20th century technologies as we had done in earlier centuries. We mustn't miss the boat this time round. And winding up, can I say, presiding officer, how glad I am that so many are taking part in this debate. One of the things I look forward to over the next 40 minutes or so is hearing members raise impacts and opportunities that hadn't occurred to me. I would like to press the Minister to consider taking forward some specific actions. My ask would be that some government resource is applied to this technology, not just to maintain a watching brief on autonomous vehicles developments elsewhere, but to work proactively with local government, think tanks, the private sector and others in Scotland to identify at-risk sectors and businesses and work proactively with them to identify business transition plans supported by necessary investments, to identify business opportunities and careers of the future. And I set the Government Innovations Unit a challenge to come up with a list of 100 such new careers, perhaps on a competition to raise awareness and spark entrepreneurial innovation, to quantify these impacts and to bring forward specific actions with a view to putting Scotland in the driving seat the self-driving seat on this technology, to understand how our tax and social security systems will deal with this new world. At some point, sooner rather than later, a moonshot statement setting out publicly a determination for Scotland to be the first country in the world to create a 100% self-drive city would be very welcome indeed. Opportunities like this come along every half century or so. They can utterly transform our wealth and well-being, but only if we move proactively and quickly. Let's not miss the boat. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr McKee. I call Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Jamie Green. Mr Gibson, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I wish to first congratulate my colleague Ivan McKee on securing time to debate this fascinating topic. Just a few short years ago, this debate would have been relegated to sci-fi fan circles and online message boards. Now, driverless vehicles and the wider topic of artificial intelligence are amongst the key issues being discussed in our universities, the private sector, our justice systems and political institutions. Rapidly accelerating artificial intelligence and robotics research is already transforming our world and our transport network is not immune to its advance. It is even suggested at last year's Scotland's Future Forum programme launch that by 2030 driving will be the pursuit of leisure alone and all professional drivers will be redundant. This undoubtedly raises questions about the direct impact of this technology on Scottish jobs, particularly the tens of thousands of people in Scotland who are licensed HGV or taxi drivers or to transport people goods and even take away food. Part of our preparation for the driverless revolution must be to ensure that the profits gained are not simply absorbed by car companies and technology giants, but channel back into the economy to drive investment and generate employment. A driverless transport network could be good news for those who currently find driving inaccessible, the young, elderly, people with mobility issues or disabilities which prevent them from driving, and understand quite a number of MSPs who do not have a driving license. Communication between automated cars could also create a network which optimises traffic flow and eases congestion, meaning we will be free to perform other tasks while travelling and get from A to B more quickly. Safety may also improve once human error is removed from the equation, even if many of us may still have doubts about putting our lives in the hands of a machine, myself included. Of course, automated vehicles will not only lead to a revolution in our transport network, but also in our commercial and residential spaces, as Ivan McKee uh, mentioned. Just as the arrival of cars created huge demographic, demographic shifts and preceded the construction of motorways to connect our cities and parking spaces to facilitate commuter lifestyles, a fleet of driverless vehicles could dramatically reshape urban planning. A report by engineering consultancy firm WSP suggested autonomous vehicles could free up 15 to 20 per cent of the UK's developable land, throwing up boundless opportunities for new homes, workplaces and green space, which is why I'm surprised the Greens are not here to participate in this debate. High-end cars are already programmed with over 100 million lines of computer code, which will increase exponentially with the arrival of driverless cars. This leads to interesting and unexpected questions about the practical and moral implications of this technology. 
How, for example, are we to programme cars with an understanding of moral philosophy? If an autonomous car is on a crowded motorway and knows it's about to crash, how will it decide which other car to collide with? This modern imagining of the old ethical puzzle known as the trolley problem, whereby a runaway trolley barrels down railway tracks. Ahead are five people tied up, unable to move. The trolley is headed straight for them. You're standing some distance off next to a lever. If you pull the lever, the trolley will switch to a different set of tracks. However, there is one person tied on the side track. You have two options. Do nothing and the trolley kills the five people on the main track. Pull the lever, diverting the trolley onto the side track where it will kin kill one person. Which is the ethical choice? Of course, there could be many variables as to who the people are. The choice is difficult, so how would a machine fare? Most of us are either excited about this new technology and the opportunities it presents, or we're afraid of its consequences for our economy and the fabric of society itself. However, with a proactive approach, I believe Scotland can help shape the development of automation. By investing in education and encouraging technological innovation, we can strengthen our talent base and guarantee that Scottish design and excellence are at the forefront of technological advances. We must also protect low-paid, low-skilled workers from being swept aside by the inevitable influx of automated labour. Presiding officer, what sets us mortals apart from machines is our creativity, our ability to design innovative solutions to problems, to weigh up risks and take a lead of, leap of faith when we believe in our vision. Only by harnessing what makes us unique and making the right choices before the dawn of this technology can we lead the way instead of being left behind. This debate will not be the beginning and end of the Scottish Parliament's discussion on the topic of automation, but are the start of a serious and long-term consideration of the opportunities and challenges it presents. Thank you very much, Mr Gibson. I call Jamie Green to be followed by David Stewart. Mr Green, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I apologise to the Chamber if my voice gives up halfway through this. Uh, I think the events of this week are taking their toll in my larynx. Where is Miles Briggs when you need him? Indeed. Uh, driverless cars, I, I'm really fascinated by the, the sort of utopia picture that uh, Ivan McKee is painting. I think it's, uh, it sounds wonderful. The idea will sit in the back of our cars as they talk to us, they take us where we want to go. Well, well, we listen to our favourite radio show, in my case, it's The Archers, uh, or sit there and catch up with our standard responses and signing motions. Sounds like a great idea. It would free up so much of my time as I spend <coughs> so many hours of my life on the M8. Uh, but technology like this, the Minister, is, is, you're welcome to intervene and tell me how wonderful the trains are. Minister. As a solution to your driving on the M8, can I suggest public transport is a good way forward? Like the trains, for example. Mr Green. Uh, I commend the Minister and his endeavours. The problem is, is that, uh, and it is a problem, is that the, uh, uh, with the type of jobs that we have, uh, and like many other people, getting from point A to B to C to D, in the way that we do it, may not always be easily possible by public transport. Uh, and that is a genuine uh, concern. That's probably an argument for another day in how we get people out of cars altogether. But the idea that uh, this is a th thing of the future uh, it really isn't true. It's actually a thing of today. Now, I've been in a Tesla car. If you haven't done it before, do try it. It is fascinating. It's a fascinating and, and wonderful experience. Uh, these cars already can drive themselves. They have the technology and ability to do it to, uh, in terms of the engineering of the cars, but they don't have the software to do it. And the reason they don't have the software to do it is because the legislation dictates that the cars cannot self-drive. The cars can, in many cases, already self-drive, and in some countries, they do. But I think, uh, you know, what, what part of the debate today should be looking at both the positive and the negative, and not to be negative, but to look at the consequences of that. There will be implications uh, of having more driverless cars on our roads. Uh, some positive ones, for example, the environmental aspects, as has been outlined. The majority of these types of cars will be <coughs> hybrid or electric, which is positive. It's, uh, they're, they are safe and environmentally friendly. Uh, and I think we should welcome these changes. But we should also be wary uh, of the potential downsides of this technology. <clears throat> um, now, one of the great uh, things I noticed uh, when I lived in London for a period was the fact that uh, many of the terraced houses had converted all their front gardens into driveways. And the reason people did that is because there simply wasn't enough parking. Uh, and uh, that led to a decline in the bee population of London. So the idea we could reverse those trends, uh, get more green spaces, is, is great. Uh, I'd like to touch on the economic and uh, uh, industrial points of this. It is absolutely inevitable that uh, driverless cars or driverless vehicles uh, will lead to a decline in paid driving jobs, I believe. And I think that does uh, have an effect. Um, now, there is argument, of course, that people will adapt, the workforce will adapt, and they will do other things with their time. Uh, but before we had cars, we had 
horses and carriages to travel. The introduction of cars did not lead to the horses finding new jobs. Uh, it led to a decline, probably, in horse employment. Uh, probably that some might think that's a blessing, no least the horses themselves. But it does uh, create an interesting dilemma to us. What do we do with people who currently drive for a living? And so many people in this country do, whether they're taxi drivers, hauliers, uh, uh, etc., delivery drivers. What other opportunities and careers? Uh, yes, for sure. Ivan McKee. Member's point about horses, but really got to think about the people that looked after the horses, of which there were many, many tens or hundreds of thousands in those days who obviously found new jobs servicing cars. Mr Green. Uh, and that's exactly my point, uh, but they had to retrain to be able to do that. So what we should be thinking about today is what do we have to train the workforce of today to do tomorrow uh, when they're no longer able to or uh, no longer want to drive cars? What are these new careers? Where are the opportunities? And what infrastructure are we putting in place to ensure that they have the right skills uh, to do that. We should also consider, and I hope in the debate someone will talk about what happens when it goes wrong, if it goes wrong. What are the consequences on liability and culpability? What are the consequences on insurance uh, and how we pay for that? What are the consequences on our roads and how we invest in infrastructure in our roads? Uh, I do hope that driverless cars are able to avoid potholes, especially the ones in North Ayrshire. Thank you. Thank you. I call David Stewart, who followed by Ash Denham. Mr Stewart, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and could I congratulate Ivan McKee for securing the debate today and thank him for his interesting and stimulating speech, which I certainly learnt a lot from. I particularly liked his reference to the country and western song. Um, so I don't know whether we could say I, I lost my heart to a driverless Ford Mustang, but maybe not. Um, but anyway, over the uh, past um, eight years, I... <laughs> I have, uh, perhaps I shouldn't give up my day job, presiding officer, but for the last eight years, I've championed the cause of road safety, not just across the Highlands and Islands, but across Scotland as a whole. And as members may know, I became involved in this issue in 2010, when two teenagers were tragically killed in a road collision in Inverness. So as part of that work, I set up the North of Scotland Driver Awareness Scheme, which had over 25 initiatives on road safety, uh, involving the graduate driving, uh, driving license scheme, for example. So anything that makes roads safer is something I'm very interested in. So I'd like to compliment Ivan McKee for having the debate and for all the speakers we've had already today. So it leads me to the debate today. Are they safe? and are they a step in the right direction. But there's absolutely no doubt that fully autonomous self-driving vehicles are on the way. There obviously are some concerns that many of us may confuse assisted driving technologies with automated driverless vehicles. So assisted driving technologies could include the use of cruise control, lane control, automatic braking, collision avoiding systems, and so on. The key is that the systems are designed to help the driver. So where do I stand in this debate? Well, obviously the jury's still out. But with cars becoming more and more sophisticated and the driver becomes supported more and more by driving technology, it's only a matter of time, in my view, before, before we will see fully automated cars. But as um, Ivan McKee himself said, the facts speak for themselves. 90% of road collisions are caused by driver behaviour and driver error. So clearly this shows that human beings are not totally up to the job. But certainly it's a big step to go completely to un automated cars. Many would argue that we need better education and more and more driver assistance via technology. And in, in this debate so far, President Officer, we haven't looked at the possibility of hackers breaking into the automat automated systems of automating cars and making the cars do things it shouldn't. Has the industry looked at this particular issue? I believe that they're starting to look at to this to some extent, and some voices in the pro-automated car side of the debate point out that humans cause road collisions so surely it's safer to ride on technology. So is it safer to hand over total control of a vehicle? Well, to determine whether automated vehicles are safer than humans, researchers clearly need to establish a non-collision rate for both human drivers and those emerging driverless vehicles. I am for all or any action that improves road safety. I'm excited by the possibility of entry of a street seeing fully automated vehicles, and we have, have to pass stringent testing for, but now I think that with driver assisted systems is here for years to come and yes improved systems are good let me give you an example with volvo cars they can detect a possible collision be that with a vehicle or a pedestrian and make the car break and stop we have cars that alert us when we move out of a lane and we have intelligent braking systems and cruise control all are a positive addition to making roads safer for all in reality the time for a person jumping into the rear seat of a vehicle and reading a newspaper while the vehicle drives off on its own is a long way off in my opinion with much work to do in safety 
but with our improved and increased high-tech support systems, we are moving in that direction. And in the not distant future, I, will be I believe we will see automated vehicles on the road. It is my belief that they will begin with a system of automation similar to the tram, in which they will run separately to other road vehicles along a set route and between two points. An example of this, and I've got the transport minister in front of me, I would make a plea for an automated vehicle pilot between Inverness City and Inverness uh, Airport. In conclusion, um, uh, President Officer, the Chief Exec of Telsa Cars said, and I quote, where it gets tricky is that in the urban environment around 30 to 40 miles an hour. Right, right now, it's fairly easy to deal with things that blow 5 to 10 miles an hour because we can do that with ultrasonics. We just make sure it doesn't hit anything. But it gets more complicated as you go to a higher speed. So in conclusion, President Officer, in the immediate future, we'll all benefit from partial autonomous technology such as lane changing systems. Fully autonomous technology is still a distance away. It needs isolations and testing in autonomous cities like the one developed by the University of Michigan. And as President John F. Kennedy said, change is the law of life, and those who look only to the past or present are certain to miss the future. Thank you. Uh, I call Ash Denham to be followed by Jamie Halker Johnson. Ms. Denham, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I'd also like to add my congratulations to others on Ivan Key securing this very uh, interesting debate this afternoon. So the recent development of autonomous vehicles represents something of a transport revolution and not just for those of us that had to take their driving test four times. Um, and Ivan is right to acknowledge that now is the time to be considering the impacts that they will have on our society. Um, others have drawn attention to the benefits that they offer, so things like reduced carbon emissions, less congestion, fewer road accidents. But there also could be potential negative consequences, and a couple of speakers have uh, made note of those. Uh, these sort of improvements in technology can and probably will have an impact on jobs. And so we need to make sure that the benefits also of these types of technology are spread across many different providers and accrue to society rather than just being concentrated into the hands of only a few companies. So we'll need to take account of those issues as we also look towards the future and the many possible advantages. Um, and what stood out for me on this subject when I was looking into this is the way in which autonomous and self-driving cars will allow us to radically transform the cities we live in. And as um, someone who represents a city, I think that's a very exciting potential opportunity. While automated vehicles will rewrite the rules of transport, they will also offer us the opportunity to reclaim the environment that surrounds us and shape our cities for tomorrow. And cities today are often dominated by cars, by overbearing traffic, um, congestion sometimes, and expansive multi-storey car parks. So the future of these autonomous vehicles reimagines private car ownership. Um, vehicle pods, as Ivan mentioned, capable of carrying several people at once, less of a personal car and more of a robo-taxi. Summoned using our phones, transport in the future would centre around these shared journeys. By 2035, it is predicted that 80% of people will use robo-taxis and that urban car ownership will have fallen by 70%. And much of the meaningful impact of alternative vehicles, therefore, relies on promoting this shared use aspect, reducing the number of cars on the road, which has got to be a good thing. And so what does this mean potentially for our cities? Well, the opportunity to reclaim that space that's currently used for traffic lanes, for car parks and for on-road parking, which would be a huge benefit in my own constituency of Edinburgh Eastern. Cities that use only autonomous vehicles would need 90% less parking. And be, by reclaiming almost all of the 15 to 30% of space used for car parks in cities, we open up possibilities for innovative development in urban areas. Uh, no longer would we need to choose between necessary housing or, on the other hand, community spaces, but we could offer both creative housing and sports facilities, art projects, public squares and spaces. And in doing so, we can create cities and public areas that prioritise the people that live in them and not their cars. We can create city spaces and centres that are characterised by extended pedestrian areas, designated cycle lanes and green parks. In Brooklyn and New York, the introduction of protected cycle lanes increased the number of cyclists three times over and reduced speeding and crash injuries to road users by 60%. In Copenhagen, four times as many people now cycle as they do drive. So by encouraging these alternative uses for car space, we're able to create healthier, greener towns and cities. And this, for me, is of particular interest and this prospect of future technological advances being used in this way to regenerate our communities and improve quality of life for all of us. 
Thank you very much. I call Jamie Halker Johnson to be followed by Tom Arthur. Mr. Halker Johnson, please. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Pres Presiding Officer, uh, and I congratulate uh, Ivan McKee on securing this debate today, which has verged between something from tomorrow's world and the Jetsons, but it's quite clear that this is going to be a uh, you know, real um, development for the future and one very important one. Um, there has been a significant de uh, deal, of dis uh, deal of discussion on connected and autonomous vehicles in recent years. There are a number of systems which have been demonstrated already with very varying levels of automation. Uh, and I welcome the action taken by the UK government in investigating the future benefits and equipping the UK for regulatory change that such vehicles may involve. The Department of Transport obviously has a key role here, but many of the future benefits have been championed by the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. As the Secretary of State Greg Clark has highlighted, the UK industri industri industrial strategy will be a, excuse the pun, key driver of innovation into new technology like this across the country. And its featuring in the industrial strategy white paper was very welcome. Greg Clark has set out a key ambition to make the UK the best place in the world to develop CAV technology going forward. Indeed, some of the ele elements of these innovations are already emerging on assisted technologies in today's vehicle. As has been mentioned, advanced road braking and lane changing assistance spring to mind. In that role, they are preventing accidents and lowering the harm that can come. We have a proud record here with Britain's roads amongst the safest in the world. Much has changed over the past decade since car ownership became co commonplace. There will be much on our roads that will change in the future, and Ivan McKee is right that we should plan early to make changes for new technology. There are clearly many areas here where the Scottish and UK governments can work together, making progress on preparing for the future and sharing information to ensure that regulatory frameworks are in place to enable development and progress. And so I welcome the answer that the Minister Humza Yusuf gave to my colleague Jamie Green in 2016, indicating that Transport Scotland was already working closely with the Department for, for Transport and the Centre for Connected and Autonomous Vehicles. From the perspective of my own region, the Highlands and Islands, there's enormous potential here too. In rural areas, driverless cars would be a positive development, helping to connect up remote communities, lowering costs and making travel easier. The economic and social benefits could be significant and touch all parts of our local economy. The House of Lords Science and Technology Select Committee cautioned that there was too great a political focus on driverless cars when the benefits of autonomous vehicles were most likely to appear first in other sectors, such as marine and agriculture. I'm aware that these sectors have been considered by colleagues around the chamber, but it's worth emphasizing their importance in a region like mine. We have a significant reliance on agriculture particularly, and new technology can have a major impact on efficiency. It would, of course, be short-sighted to overlook the significant barriers to remain, that remain to the mass rollout of driverless vehicles at this stage. As a result, I caution against too many glances into crystal balls today. The technology aspect is only one consideration amongst many. How our society and market forces respond to these vehicles will be interesting. Emergent technology is often accompanied by concerns, and there is little more unnerving than passing over your entire safety to the hands of an automated system. Surveys have shown a reluctance amongst many, especially in older generations, of this loss of control on our roads. Gains may also be different from what we expected. It has been readily observed that a number of benefits of automated vehicles only become apparent when a critical mass, or indeed all, vehicles are automated. We can envisage far more precise and efficient movement on our roads, but these vehicles will, at least initially, still have to cope with human error and behavior. For some years now, we have seen a move away from road transport, yet increases in road travel may again be a feature of our future transport planning. How our roads, town centers, and businesses adapt to that will need a real response from the Scottish Government at an early stage. Thank you. Um, I call Tom Arthur to be followed by Alec Rowley. Mr Arthur, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to uh, begin by congratulating Ivan McKee uh, on securing this debate. And also want to welcome the tone that Ivan McKee took, which I thought was very positive and energetic. And sometimes it's easy in Parliament, and I imagine in government, in terms of dealing with the day-to-day -day business, to almost become managerial and having to just deal with what's in front of you. But as a role, we do have to be setting a vision and an agenda for the future. And, and while I recognise the uh, comments that Jamie Halcrow Johnson made, suggesting that somewhere between tomorrow's world and the Jetsons, uh, Ivan McKee's motion makes reference to 2030. That's only 12 years hence. If we think 12 years ago, how many of us were using Twitter, Facebook, other social media platforms, who would have predicted the disruptive impact that Netflix has had, not just on how we consume digital content, but indeed how digital content is generated? 
Now, of course, the issue of automation we're speaking about is about the actual um, way in which vehicles would be piloted by computers as opposed to people. But, of course, automation has been with the automobile industry for a long time. Indeed, autom uh, the automation of the manufacturing of automobiles has been a significant part. And that's something I can very much relate to. My constituency of Renfrewshire South is home to Linwood, which is synonymous with a car plant which um, being closed down because it was deemed to be economically inefficient and all of the uh, huge unemployment and issues that followed forth from that. So I think the uh, concerns about disruption and the impact upon existing jobs are very serious concerns that we must take carefully. I think it's important that we, are, we do not react in an, an, an alarmist fashion, but we must take cognizance of these concerns and I think I would make key suggestions about horizon scanning and looking forward uh, to make sure that we are preparing and looking at opportunities to reskill and retraining are very important uh, indeed. I think one of the things I want to touch upon is some of the wider economic op opportunities that this revolution will be because it will necessitate um, the use of existing technologies, adaptions of the existing technologies and uh, potentially the development of new technologies. One such example is, um, is LIDAR, the light detection and ranging um, sensors, which are absolutely essential and fundamental for the way in which many driverless cars um, work. They essentially use laser, rather like a, a, a much more efficient and, and faster version of sonar, but use light pulses to map surroundings. Um, but what's happening um, has been occurring lately is there's been such demand for LIDAR that um, producers of these devices have been struggling to keep up and there's been six months delays. And what this has resulted is in a lot of startups are potentially going to disrupt that market by moving to more solid state technologies. Scotland, of course, has, has had a, a very strong um, sector in lasers and sensors. And I'd be always keen to look at ways in which um, our own economy can benefit um, from the actual manufacturing of these devices. But as the First Minister has stated out, not just to be a consumer of the products of the future, but to actually be actively uh, developing and, and engaging with them. So there's real economic opportunities there, but there's also, of course, the economic threats that I alluded to already, what the, the threats pose to the haulage industry, to public transport, bus drivers, taxi drivers, delivery drivers, with, and how that interacts with the gig economy. And that speaks to broader issues about how we design our social security system, our taxation system, certainly. JB Green. Uh, I think uh, the member's making some very interesting points actually around uh, the types of things that we use cars for. Let's accept actually that there is a, a move not to necessarily to driverless vehicles through this, but actually to drones. And uh, that market it could potentially replace some of that driving per se. Mr. Arthur. Absolutely. I think that's an excellent point. We've seen some of the work that Amazon's already doing uh, pioneering that. Um, so, again, we, we cannot just look at this in isolation. There was one other point I just wanted to pick up before closing. I thought it was a very interesting point um, that Ivan made, which is actually the flip side. We look at the gig economy as ultimately being a threat, but I think one of the ideas that Ivan put forward was the idea where you can see your driverless vehicle as an asset to be monetized by using and lending out. So, again, that will raise concerns about, it, it raise issues about how we regulate that. Um, particular market and again I think what's very important and, and what other colleagues have um, echoed this remark as well is that we have to make sure that the benefits that come from um, driverless vehicles and increased automation are actually enjoyed by all and not just simply by uh, the, the companies who are um, at the moment at the cutting edge and putting them forward and that all society can benefit from this including the wider social benefits as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, before I call the next speaker, uh, due to the number of members remaining who wish to speak in the rate, I'm minded to accept a motion without notice under Rule 8.14.3 to extend the debate by up to 30 minutes. Can I now invite Mr McKee to move a motion without notice? Uh, moved. The question is that the debate be extended by up to 30 minutes. Are we all agreed? That's agreed. I now call Alec Rowley to be followed by Emma Harper. Mr Rowley, please. Thank you, President Officer. When I first read Ivan McKee's motion, I was struck by the number of areas listed as likely to be impacted by this new technology as it moves from the pages of science fiction straight into being part of our daily lives. Just on Tuesday, I saw on the BBC that the self-flying air taxi has been unveiled in New Zealand. What is abundantly clear is that the future envisaged by writers and filmmakers is fast becoming a reality and it is the responsibility of governments all around the world to recognise the impacts, both good and bad, that this future holds. 
This type of innovation and the pace of change currently attracts a large amount of media attention as well as public debate. But the implications of this technology go far beyond changing the way we move goods and people either locally or, or around the world. And just as has always been the case, when the world has witnessed massive technological change, there will be a wide-ranging impact as societies and economies across the globe learn to respond and adapt. It is difficult to fully imagine all the potential consequences. However, we must anticipate that the change that's coming and learn how best to work with that change. Crucially, as the motion states, we must make sure that the benefits of the change in technology are available to all. By understanding the direction of change, we can anticipate any negative consequences, try to mitigate them, and at the same time, work with the positive consequences to deliver the best outcome for society as a whole. There are benefits for individuals. Will Hutton, the chair of the Innovation Centre, has op 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 optimistically pointed out that roads will be able to carry more traffic and be safer. Your car will deliver you to your home or place of work and then park itself without you. Road accidents will plummet. Energy efficiency will be transformed. Insurance rates, even the need for insurance, will plunge. But Mr Hutton also highlights the risks. All sorts of jobs involving maintaining conventional cars will disappear. The cars themselves will be made by robots and automated car factories. The new jobs will be in the design and marketing of the cars and in writing the computer software that will allow them to navigate their journeys along with the apps for our mobile phones that will help us use them better. Automation is a very real concern and possibly one of the biggest issues facing us as a society as we move forward through the 21st century. As technological advancements continue to expand and as has always been the case, workers can result uh, and suffer as a result. At the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, workers' rights were virtually non-existent. It was through the hard work of the trade union and labour movement that safer and better working conditions were won. The world we live in today owes a great deal to those who fought for it from within that movement. And so it must be the case moving forward that we work to ensure that technological advancements are to the benefits of all, that workers aren't left on the sideline. We know the direction that technology is moving, so we must ensure that we plan accordingly. That means developing skilled workforce and skilled workers now, from an early age, able to work in the world of tomorrow. Thank you very much, Mr Rowley. I call Emma Harper to follow by Finlay Carson. Mr Carson will be the last speaker in the open debate. Ms Harper, please. Thank you, President Officer. I'd like to also add my congratulations to Ivan... Ivan McKee for securing this debate and as an MSP who is in rural South Scotland region I spend a lot of time in my car on the A75, 76 and A77 and other roads driving to visit rural farms and businesses and I know that the Minister already has those roads on his uh, radar already. Um, I welcome Ivan McKee's description of the ability to perhaps make my journeys much more productive with technology assisting making my uh, journey maybe more than just about driving from A to B. And while the technological developments behind the driverless car revolution are fascinating, the implications for our society are perhaps even more interesting. First of all, it might be counterintuitive to see that some of the studies show that driverless cars are actually safer. Some people would think that that was not the case. But it might result in fewer people being killed in road accidents every year. And our streets might be clearer too. And many experts predict that car ownership will become a rare phenomenon. Instead of uh, people, they'll drive higher cars or there will be um, transport might be delivered by a service from companies who own fleets of uh, self-drive or driverless vehicles. And because the cars will be electric, they will help us to dramatically cut carbon emissions. And as a former member of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee, I welcome the reduction in carbon emissions. 
And as a registered nurse, I'm interested in how driverless cars can be revolutionary for healthcare. Experts predict that health-related sensors installed in vehicles could detect various medical and health-related conditions. And as soon as the passenger enters the, the vehicle, they can pick up their vital signs, for instance. And when an emergency vehicle situation develops, an ambulance response time could be dramatically improved. And in addition, you know, like any other vehicle on the road, ambulances face obstacles, including other drivers who don't obey the law when they see or hear an emergency vehicle coming. So self-driving automated vehicles controlled by an integrated system might open a path to allow an ambulance through. There's also potential... Absolutely, thank you. Yeah. Jamie Green. Uh, I uh, apologise, it seems like I'm intervening a lot. It's, it's a very fascinating subject and uh, I think there's lots of areas we can probe. I've always been uh, fascinated by the concept that cars uh, don't have automatic breathalysers, for example, automatic breathalysers, uh, which would then uh, uh, make it unable to drive or operate a car or even start a car if it detects signs of alcohol in the driver's breath, for example. I wondered if you had any views on that. Ms Harper. Um, if it was a driverless car, then there wouldn't need to be a breathalyser in it. But I know, I'm not sure I understand your intervention because um, there are cars that are available that actually make people blow in to a breathalyser, which allows them to either turn the ignition on or off. But I mean, for us here today, we're talking about cars that are driverless. So I wouldn't imagine that that technology would need to be required in this. I'd like to bring it back to the actual debate about driverless cars and um, when we're talking about the automatic vehicles that are controlled by the integrated system we want to make sure that uh, the engagement of the people in the in the driving or in the actual situation can actually manage to f focus on health and support health care so my other example was about people getting dialysis. Monday, Wednesday and Friday, they could be picked up from their home, transported from their home to their hospital for their dialysis appointments. Um, the, the health aspects of the technology actually could be really quite good in helping elderly drivers um, actually keep outside and engaging. For instance, with people with dementia, they can continue to go about their daily routines with the support of a driverless vehicle. And as we age, our ability to react quickly while driving, um, it, it can deteriorate and this can have an enormous impact on people's lives. There was one study done in America that showed that uh, when people's driver's license were taken away from them, they were more likely to experience depression. So having the ability to have access to continued you know, open spaces actually might support uh, better care for people. The legislative and regulatory frameworks on autonomous vehicles are reserved to the UK government, but I'm pleased that the Minister has indicated support and encouragement for research, testing and development. So for me, I think this is an exciting time to look forward. I think I would love to see engagement from the Scottish Government to be proactive on this. And again, I welcome Ivan McKee's uh, debate. Call Finlay Carson. Deputy President Officer, I'd also like to thank Ivan for bringing this debate to the Chamber and I'm pleased... Can I just stop you there? I've been letting it, I've been letting it slip through, but we do need full names in here. I know it's quite chummy today, yeah, but yeah. not as chummy as that, please. I'd like to thank uh, Ivan McKee for bringing this debate to the Chamber today and I'm pleased that there was a parking space left for me to contribute to this important subject. The only issue is there is so much four or five minutes is nothing like enough time to cover all the exciting possibilities. I believe that driverless cars are absolutely the future and definitely just around the next bend in the road. Indeed, I believe we're accelerating in terms of how we're progressing. Now, Jamie uh, Halko Johnson and other members have mentioned that it's not just about the technologies that the legal and the, the social aspect of it, but I was going to concentrate on where we are now. Many bog standard family cars already are controlled to a great extent with the technology within them technology that could almost drive themselves right now. So we've got sat-navs, for example, that are so incredibly accurate, allowing for pinpoint accuracy uh, and, the, and where your car's placed on the road. We've got lane sensing radar, as we've heard, adjusting the steering wheels of cars with minimal input from the driver. We've got cruise control, which can speed up and slow down a car with no manual intervention. And anyone with cruise control will no doubt have relied on the, the max speed 
uh, option uh, to make sure that you don't exceed the 30 miles per hour or the average speed zone. So we already have cars that can park themselves. However, in Edinburgh, it may be more useful if our cars could actually find a parking space. But I believe that technology is not very far away either. Automatic collision avoidance means that cars never need to collide with anything. Again, something that we have in a lot of, of top of the range models. So we already have these technologies. All we need to do now is really join them up. And we have fully uh, autonomous um, cars. As my as the party spokesman for the digital economy, I can see this technology has extremely wide-reaching benefits for all our communities, rural and urban. Uh, the new car technology is constantly evolving, as is how we use data and big data. And in the very near future, if it's not already happening in some of our cities, we will have our journeys, uh, the data of our journeys stored and anonymously used in computer modeling systems to control air quality and cut congestion in our urban areas. Furthermore, if we're looking to cut down in the number of vehicles on a road, then this is the perfect opportunity to look at driverless HGVs. Traveling in automated convoys, braking and accelerating together and controlled by a driver and a lead vehicle is a fantastic way to cut out congestion and emissions on our heavy goods vehicles. Using roads during the night and early morning rather than clogging up, up our major routes at peak times. Now, there are issues surrounding uh, lorry convoys, but they're not insurmountable. And as more vehicles become uh, autonomous, once again, with computers, uh, they'll be able to manage traffic to mi uh, minimize travel times and reduce delays. Uh, living in a rural area, having access to a car is pretty much a prerequisite for staying there, particularly with the poor or non-existent public transport links in some of these community communities. Automated cars could be revolutional, uh, re revolutionize uh, rural life and, and uh, take away what we see just now with regards to social isolation. But it's not just our rural areas that will benefit. Our major cities like Edinburgh and Glasgow could save up to £45 million a year by reducing the amount of road crashes, according to a report by engineering company Parsons Brinkenhoff. Now, you can't put a price on the value of saving a life, but £45 million on reducing accidents sounds like not too bad a place to start. The Chancellor, Philip Hammond, said in last year's budget that he wanted to see driverless cars on our roads by 2021. That might seem ambitious, but from what I've already said, I don't think it is. Rolling out driverless cars could be one of the most ambitious things Scotland has ever done. With Scotland known around the world for being a nation of innovators, this could be another feather in our caps as having led the driverless car revolution. And I had a number of uh, car manufacturing companies based in my constituent in Galloway, which unfortunately are long gone, but we might see those coming back. I share and agree very much with Ivan McKee's ambitions, but the plans are progressing at a very rapid rate, and it's important that we're having this debate today and explore all the ways in which Scotland can benefit from this transformational change. Thank you very much. I call on Hamza Youssef to close for the Government Minister. Up to seven <coughs> minutes, please. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I, of course, uh, join with others in thanking Ivan McKee for bringing uh, this motion to the Chamber? An incredibly uh, interesting, insightful uh, and energetic debate by all uh, involved. Uh, a lot of food for thought for all of us, uh, I suspect. But I want to give some reassurance that some of that thought absolutely is going in uh, from a governmental level, both from the Scottish Government and we're working very closely uh, with the UK Government on this and I will touch upon that uh, in a second. It's interesting, I mean, obviously I have a number of transport meetings uh, with a number of stakeholders uh, and Ivan McKee is absolutely right that um, uh, whether you are in favour of the idea of autonomous vehicles or connected and autonomous vehicles uh, or whether you're opposed to it, it's coming and everybody understands it's coming. Uh, but there are still some doubters and some of those uh, challenges that exist potentially uh, with, uh, as I say, autonomous vehicles, automated vehicles, uh, are something that I want to try to touch upon uh, and try to see how we can, uh, how we can uh, perhaps dispel some of the misconceptions that exist, but also reassure people with some of the doubts uh, that they have. Though actually, I think one of the strongest arguments, perhaps, uh, for if you don't, uh, you don't uh, believe that uh, autonomous cars are advantageous, one of the strongest arguments, perhaps, is Ivan McKee's opening statement that it can banish the school run. I think all of us would agree that's not a bad thing. Um, in terms of the opportunities that will be brought uh, by automated uh, vehicles, 
uh, and connected and automated uh, vehicles. Uh, fewer crashes on our road. I, I think uh, a number of statistics were used, ranging from kind of 85% of all reported UK road incidents uh, factoring in human error right the way through to 95%. To, to Either way, whatever statistic you use, you can agree that the vast majority of those accidents are down to, to human error. So, uh, as uh, uh, Finlay Carson rightly said, you can't put a price uh, on, of course, one life uh, being saved. Uh, but certainly, of course, uh, this would make a, it could potentially bring a huge, huge advantage. Uh, freedom for travel for those who currently find it difficult to travel. Uh, Finlay Carson and Emma Harper uh, mentioned this, particularly in a rural context, as did uh, a couple of other members. Uh, but perhaps also when we think about those with um, mobility issues uh, as well, there's, uh, there's an advantage uh, potentially there as well. More efficient road networks that are safer, smoother and swifter. Finlay Carson in his uh, remarks mentioned uh, HGV platooning. I think that's a good uh, example. Avoid stop-start uh, congestion. That, of course, reduces the environmental uh, impact uh, of driving. Um, jobs was mentioned by a lot of people. A uh, question around, uh, will it have a negative effect, a positive effect? And I'll come to some of the stats uh, and the figures uh, uh, later on in, in my contribution. Uh, but I certainly believe that the creation of new jobs in technology uh, and the automotive, sect uh, automotive sectors, um, building, as many members have said, building on Scotland's already reputation, strong reputation for innovation and scientific excellence is another advantage. Uh, we are uh, absolutely right to always be uh, ambitious for Scotland. Um, however, it is worth saying that this transformation uh, is uh, in its uh, infancy. I, I think it's likely that initial products will probably be cost prohibitive uh, to the majority. Uh, markets will adapt. Just how quickly obviously remains uh, to be seen. I do have some scepticism about some of the time frames uh, surrounding this, uh, but as many members here have said, it's better that Scotland is in the automated driving seat or whatever pun you wish to use, ahead of the curve uh, as opposed to lagging uh, behind as the First Minister set out on her programme for government. She wants Scotland to be the innovator and the producers of innovation, uh, not, uh, of course, just the uh, consumers uh, of it. Uh, according to uh, research commissioned by the Society of Motor Manufacturers and Traders, uh, connected and autonomous vehicles can bring wider economic uh, benefits. So many have asked around the jobs that could potentially come as a result of this transformational transport uh, revolution. Um, it is estimated by their research, uh, of course, the £51 billion per year by 2030, uh, potentially. So, and that's uh, creating more than 320,000 jobs. So, uh, again, uh, may want to take that uh, with a, a little pinch of, of salt, but uh, certainly, uh, even if half of those benefits are realised, we're talking about billions of pounds uh, into the UK economy and hundreds of thousands uh, of jobs uh, being uh, created. Uh, in terms of uh, where we are as a, as, as a government, uh, we're very much open for business for trials uh, and connect, uh, of connected and autonomous vehicles. The Scottish Government is very keen to explore this with the UK Government. We're already uh, having those discussions uh, with uh, the, the Centre for Connected and Autonomous Vehicles, uh, CCAV, uh, Scottish Enterprise and many others uh, and ways in which we can facilitate some of those trials, demonstration projects and pilots in Scotland. A number of members have already given suggestions of where they, in their constituencies or regions uh, those trials uh, might take place. And in all seriousness, uh, of course, they should continue to filter those ideas uh, to us. Uh, in terms of uh, how we can take this forward, I think Ivan McKee laid down a couple of challenges for government uh, in relation to how we might take this uh, forward. And, and although we're doing a fair bit of work, particularly with uh, stakeholders, uh, one of the things that I've committed to do uh, is we will be holding a connected and autonomous vehicle demonstration summit uh, in 2018. That will showcase international developments, uh, explore with the transport industry now how Scotland can best position itself to realise the benefits and proactively we'll be seeking in that summer, summit uh, the opportunity to support a trial uh, such as perhaps possibly even with the freight and logistics sectors. Uh, what I will do though is I'll ensure that every member that's spoken in this debate is given information about that summit and if they're able to attend of course we'd be delighted uh, to have them. Uh, yes of course. <coughs> Mr Green, obviously this is a very of interest to you. Mr Green. It's a Interest to everyone, I hope. Uh, uh, mi Minister, uh, the, your government has just presided over the building and quite a substantial piece of infrastructure investment in the MA, MC4, MC3. Uh, are those motorways, uh, as they currently sit, capable of accommodating driverless vehicles such as the uh, ones that Finley Carson did? And what element of uh, uh, planning went into this particular subject when those were being designed and built? Minister. We've got a way to go in that, if I'm honest. I mean, if you look at uh, the programme for government and the First Minister's statement around making the A9, which we're drilling, of course, the first electric highway, uh, perhaps for future uh, infrastructure projects, we have to be looking at the first autonomous 
uh, highway. So I think there's more work to be done in that, frankly. Uh, we are, of course, bringing forward intelligent transport systems. We have one in, uh, across the fourth, of course, but we're trying to see where else we can roll that out. So uh, just because it hasn't been uh, uh, part of the, the, the initial, uh, perhaps, design uh, of uh, infrastructure projects, that's not to mean that it can't be bolted on afterwards. But I think we've got a way to go in that, and I think it's a, it's a good point to raise. Uh, my last, I know time is very, very short. I just want to give members reassurance around the legal and the legislative framework uh, around this. I mean, uh, we are, of course, uh, uh, having conversations around this. Uh, what I would say to members, to give them that reassurance, is that Transport Scotland, we're working with the Scottish Law Commission. Uh, it's progressing at the moment, a joint three-year review uh, alongside the Law Commissions of England and Wales of the driving laws and preparation of self-driving vehicles. It aims to deliver this by 2021, uh, a modern, robust package of reforms promoting automated vehicles and their use as part of public transport networks and on-demand passenger services. The Law Commission will be working closely with the Centre for uh, Connected and Autonomous Vehicles and developing its policy proposals. And as I say, we're very much uh, a part of that. Let me just conclude by thanking again uh, Ivan McKee for securing this motion. Let me ensure uh, that members are given an invitation to the summit that takes place uh, later uh, this year. But uh, I certainly believe, as we have said at the beginning, I think every member has reiterated that Scotland is well, well, well placed to take advantage of this technological revolution. I hope we just get on with it. Thank you. Thank you. Can I thank members for the contribution? A very interesting and wide ranging debate. That is the debate concluded, and I suspend this meeting till 2 30 pm. Thank you.